welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking some time of your Friday to, uh, to join us here. Um, this is uh, a preceptorial sponsored by Perry Worldhouse. My name is Michael Weisberg. I am a professor and the chair of the Department of Philosophy, and I'm also the director of postgraduate programs at Perry Worldhouse. And that means that um, my kind of the, the administrative role I play in Perry Worldhouse is I work on the, pro, the postdoc program and some of our visiting scholar programs. And I also coordinate for Perry Worldhouse uh, the, the work on climate change. So Perry Worldhouse is one of the several places on campus where a lot of really interesting research uh, on climate change is happening. But in our case, it's the uh, work that's on the international scene. So this is, we do, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of connections with the, the UN climate process. I also coordinate for the campus, um, the uh, campus-wide efforts in Galapagos, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna get started really soon on that, but I have a, we're gonna just to kind of get everything started, gonna ask you a, a quick little question, a poll should be coming up about what you think you're gonna major in. This is just to kind of see who's joining us today since there's too many of us to all be speaking. I was going to ask if you if you if it, the window popped up, but since eighty four percent of you have already voted, then I know that it has. Okay. So here here are the results. Um, we have a lot of natural scientists and social scientists with us today, and not so many humanists. So you can uh, here you can see the results. Well. Let me tell you that uh, Perry Worldhouse is a really, really um, wonderful place for those of you who are interested in anything involving the international space. So we range from people who are interested in things like national security and the conflicts between great powers to people more interested in human rights and refugees. And as you're going to see in my presentation today, people who are interested in thinking about natural science and social science and humanities um, and how they intersect in an international scene. So what I actually wanna do um, is uh, let you know that we're going to have a, uh, if you're interested and you, in Perry Worldhouse in, per se, um, you're gonna see a link in the chat and that's something that you can uh, register for. There's going to be a, there's a, a mailing list that, that will form. This is to take the place of uh, swiping your cards on Locust Walk. And then I'm gonna just now jump into talking a little bit about Galapagos. And in order to do that, I'm gonna ask you for one more poll on that. Let's see if we can get this to happen here. I'm gonna ask you, when you think about Galapagos, what do you see in your mind's eye? All right. So here are the results. A lot of Darwin, a lot of giant tortoises. So you'll get a little bit of each. You're not gonna get much Darwin today, but you will, you'll You'll get to see some giant tortoises. So um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really rusty sitting in a chair uh, talking to you guys. I'd like to be up moving in front, of a, uh, in front of a blackboard, but this is the world that we're living in. So let's get started. I wanna to talk to you today about a really interesting project at Penn and it's a project that has uh, largely been driven by undergraduates. And that's why I think it would be really interesting, hopefully for all of you guys. And it's uh, in large part about sea lions and Galapagos, but also a lot of other things. So for those of you that voted for giant tortoises, here they are. These are giant tortoises in the Galapagos archipelago. And as many of you said, people think about uh, tortoises, people think about finches. Um, this is the uh, sharp beak uh, ground finch and a, and a giant cactus finch and Henevesa Island. And this is what Galapagos looks like through most of the archipelago. So it's one of the most protected places in the world. It's 97% national park and 100% of the marine reserve is protected. You can see out in the distance a formation called Leon Dormido and in the mid ground that's Cerro Brujo. And this is around the spot that Dar Charles Darwin first landed in Galapagos. But one of the things that people don't think about uh, when they think about Galapagos is this, that it turns out that although 97% is national park, 3% isn't. And there are 30,000 people that live there. And unlike most of the islands in the Pacific, the people that live in Galapagos are not indigenous to Galapagos. This is actually one of the few places in the world that Europeans really found. These are regular, ordinary Ecuadorians that were moved from the mainland to Galapagos because of the chance of having better work or in some places because of explicit um, programs of resettlement. So they're essentially, if they're from the highlands, they're farmers, if they're from the coast, they're fishermen, and they made their way a thousand kilometers across the sea to live in this uh, archipelago that has essentially no water and very little capacity to create food. 
Um, this is New Year's Eve two years ago in the town of Porto Becaritza Moreno in San Cristobal Island. This is a town of 8,000 people, and this is where Penn has its uh, research site based. And if you've uh, spent any time in the Caribbean or in Central or South America, this, this would look like a very, very common scene, a big New Year's Eve party here. Now, what do the people living in Galapagos think about the part of Galapagos that you all voted for? Uh, Charles Darwin, um, the giant tortoises, the sea lions. Well, the people who live in the Galapagos for the most part think something like this. This is, a, uh, this is from an effigy from New Year's Eve in, in South America. People um, take the things that they don't like and they burn them rather than, and they take the things that they do like and carry them around. So this is an effigy uh, to be burned from someone living in San Cristobal, one of the oldest residents. And if you look in the panel um, on the left, um, one, one paragraph below the bottom, it says in Spanish that the central authorities are not interested in the inhabitants of Galapagos. They only care about animals that give them money. And so what you see in this, um, in this kind of quote is that the people who are living here they don't really experience Galapagos the way that, that many of us do. They don't think of it as a place of uh, the greatest biodiversity hotspot in the world, the UNESCO World Heritage Site number one, the place of the giant tortoises and Darwin's finches. Um, instead, what they see is that there's this national park that's out there, which for the most part, they can't even access for reasons we can talk about later. And in it are these kind of funny animals that aren't very practical and useful for their lives, unlike the donkey in this picture. And the central authorities, meaning the government, is not uh, interested in them. They're only interested in the national park. And why are they interested in the national park? Well, because it brings them money. Now, I think it's really interesting to like focus on this because this attitude that we see here, this isn't a kind of you know hostility to the environment attitude. It's actually, I think, a genuine kind of confusion. Why is it that so much attention in the world, so many resources are paid to this national park when the people that are living here have regular old problems like food and education and everything else? And so when I think about Galapagos and when I think about trying to help with the project of protection for the national park, I'm really interested in, in this particular framing of the problem that I see threats in conservation all around the world, but especially in this place, as being as coming from a lack of understanding between the inhabitants that are either in the park in some places, or in this case, at the edge of the park, and what's going on inside of it. So I've led for the last uh, half decade a project at Penn that crosses the campus. It's in across six schools, and it's to try to engage the local community of Galapagos in the ongoing project of protecting the place. And we work in four areas, community science, public health, um, climate change, resilient design, and this last thing called Conocer Galapagos. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about each of them, and then hopefully we can get into a really good discussion about Galapagos and about the people that live there. So we'll talk the most about community science because it's been the one that has had the most uh, undergraduate focus. So consider the sea lion. These are um, the Galapagos sea lion, um, if any of you are from California who are visited there, they're the close relatives of the California sea lion of the same kind that you might see in La Jolla or in Fisherman's Wharf. And the sea lions are in this middle category here. These are the IUCN uh, categories. They're EN. They are uh, an endangered species. There's only about 16,000 of them total left in the wild. And that represents about a 60% uh, decrease from about 30 years ago. So something is really decreasing the population of the sea lions. This is just a, a gratuitous cute shot here. Um, what you see is that sea lions, the Galapagos sea lions, just like California sea lions, really like uh, the same places that people do. They like beaches. They like nice, warm, flat areas because their life cycle is they spend a lot of time in the ocean hunting for food. They only eat one thing, which is fish. And then they pull themselves back out of the water when they're full and they lie on the beach and warm up and just kind of chill out here. It's not just beaches they like. So when you have a place that has settlement of people, you also end up with things like benches and sea lions like benches. They like the street, they like the sidewalk. This is still our town here. They also like fishermen's boats. Uh, fishermen 
don't like sea lions on their boats because the, the reason the sea lions like the boats besides being flat is they smell like fish. The fishermen would rather have the fish themselves and not let the sea lions have them. So they do things like put barbed wire on their boats to try to keep the sea lions off. And you can imagine tensions can build. And so much so that as the population of Galapagos has grown, the tensions between the people living there and the sea lions has increased. So what we have tried to do is to address these problems not by adding, trying to get lobby for more restrictions or anything like that, but actually engaging the community that lives in Galapagos in the process of protecting the sea lions. And here's how we do it. So we use a technique that's called community science. Community science is where you engage amateur scientists, but you don't just kind of give them a task and have them come back and sort of divide your labor. You actually engage them in every part of the scientific process, developing a project, carrying the project out, collecting the data, analyzing the data, and then communicating it back to their community. So what we've done is created a, a paradigm where faculty like me on the left there and graduate students like um, the guy in the background work with undergraduates and then work with the local community. So we start in the classroom and then um, here again in the foreground, the woman uh, not wearing a pen shirt is a pen or was a pen undergraduate and all the all the kids who are high school kids wearing pen shirts, those are local kids. And we take them out onto the beach and we teach them about sea lions. And not only do we teach them facts about sea lions, but we teach them how to study sea lions. And in this case, the effect of human beings on sea lions. So here we go. Again, we have Penn students on the left and local high school students on the right, uh, practicing this, uh, this method that they use to study sea lions. Um, we also take them into the wilderness areas and Work, show, work to show them the differences between sea lions in the wilderness and sea lions uh, in these municipal areas. So just to give you a little sense of what the science looks like here, um, what our community scientists have learned to do is uh, record information about the social structure of the sea lions, perform something called the two-meter assay, which I'll show you in a moment, and then do uh, some qualitative observation about what the sea lions are doing on the beach, um, record the noise level on the beach, and then uh, especially for you engineers in the group, we're starting to work on a technique of photo tagging individual sea lions with photography. So we're using photos and videos and machine learning to actually be able to uh, re-identify individual sea lions. So here's what the approach assay looks like. So you start from uh, six meters back, you walk up to the sea lion and see if it reacts. And then this is, a, so this is actually a measure of how aware the sea lions are of humans and how, and how aggressively they react to, to humans. And one of the things that we're interested in knowing is, do the sea lions that are living in places like this, where there's a lot of human disturbance, does that change their behavior? And we've done this for three years. We would have been doing it this summer, of course, but uh, as you all know, we are stuck in Philadelphia and they are stuck in Galapagos, but we do know that people, uh, on the beach crowd the sea lions together. And then on beaches that have more disturbance, we see sea lions that are less aggressive to people and more aggressive to other sea lions. While we're studying, while the community scientists are studying the sea lions, we are also doing assessments. This is the social science piece to really try to understand does participation in a project like this actually affect them in any way. And what we do find is that they become more intrinsically motivated for environmental action. So most ca educational campaigns are just kind of in the form of slogans or posters or something like that, or formal classroom instruction. We've been finding that we can increase people's intrinsic motivation to, uh, to environmental action just by really participating in this project. And part of the reason is that th when these high school students who participated with us over about six months, they really learn more about these sea lions than anybody else in the world. So we really have found a very deep level of engagement. I also wanna show you the last part of this project, which is that the students who are involved, they don't just collect data and give it to us, but they actually are involved in communicating to their community about what they've learned. And I think this is one of the most powerful parts of the project. So I'm just gonna show you a, a little snippet of a video message that they prepared for their community. La gente aquí dicen que los lobos son la cara de San Cristóbal, la cara de las islas, sin embargo, solo hablan y no actúan. ¿Cómo influimos nosotros como comunidad san cristobaleña en, 
en el, en el entorno, en el ciclo de mundo bomba eh, Tenemos que cuidar este ecosistema que, que es único en el mundo y que si no lo cuidamos se va a acabar pronto. So I think we can see from that that these students really learned something. I'll just say we have a lot of other ongoing projects. So um, one of them is actually teaching middle school students to uh, scuba dive and to monitor the um, to, to monitor the benthic cover. And then for the for students for either younger students or for older people in the community that don't swim or dive, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people that live here don't dive. We have this underwater drone, and you see here these two girls uh, looking at the bottom of the ocean for the first time. Uh, through this virtual reality headset. Um, a second project, which I'm not going to spend very much time on, um, is about public health. So we've engaged in a community needs assessment. This is a project that's run out of our public health group, so it's joint between nursing and uh, medicine, and um, trying to really understand what are the health needs of this community. And um, what we did in the uh, 2019 is that we Basically, in addition to the survey, we worked with the local scouts and actually gave them some public health lessons. So just like lots of Penn students who are pre-med, a lot of these students had hoped to go on to health careers. So we use that to engage them and in thinking about their health. But instead of focusing on um, uh, clinical medicine, we really focused on public health issues. Ironically, in 2020, uh, things like infectious diseases are uh, all too relevant. Um, in the future, we're hoping to do a um, community cooking project in the Galapagos, and that the idea would be to, to address some of the largest public health concerns, which happen to be uh, diet related, um, by actually making something like a kind of almost like a cooking show to really engage people. It's based on a program actually that happens at Penn that's joint between one of our local uh, very famous chefs and the School of Medicine. The third area that we've worked in is um, uh, climate change resilient design. So um, I, I realize this slide should have been at the beginning. This is actually showing you uh, in the upper left hand corner, a map of Galapagos. And then the island that we work on San Cristobal is in the southeast, the one that's green on this map. And then it's blown up in the middle of the screen to show you the full island. The town of Puerto Becarizo Moreno is that thing all the way to the west. On the left side, you see the airport strip and a, and a dark area. I'm going to see if I can bring a mouse up. I don't know that I can. I don't think I could do that in screen sharing mode. Um, and here is a, a drone flyover of the town just to give you a sense. The hill that's in the distance there is uh, Darwin's first landing spot in Galapagos for the Darwin fans in the group. But you can see there's this tiny little town and a bay and the rest of it is all just um, forested lava fields. That's mostly Palo Santo is the forest in the, in the distance. And one of the main issues that this town faces, this is a town, like I said, that's now 8,000 people. Uh, just 50 years ago, it was a town of a few hundred people. And um, the growth of this town is, is such that at the high end, it will run out of space entirely by 2050. So the gray units here are the existing units and the orange units are the proposed units. And one of the issues that you have in volcanic islands is that when there's a storm, which doesn't happen very often because it's very dry, you have absolutely enormous... Uh, velocity of rainfall because there's so much pitch on this island. Well, one of the things that we know about climate change is that the intensity of these storms that are often part of the El Nino cycle is going to increase. So if you have the combination of increased uh, density of building, which means more hard services, and increased intensity of the storms, the people living in this town are at danger from climate change, not so much because of sea level rise, but because of these super intense storms that could essentially wash their town away. So one of the things that we've worked on uh, with the School of Design is trying to think about how the town could be redesigned to, uh, to better withstand the effects of climate change. We've also done a project, um, I'll just skip ahead a little bit here, uh, to map the coastline really precisely using drones. So what you're looking at here is all of the measurements that we took to actually create this 3D model of the coastline. And it turns out the official Ecuadorian maps are between one and three meters off uh, in terms of the elevation of the coastline. So thinking about sea level risk and thinking about tsunami risk requires you have accurate coastal maps. Most of the world, I think 150 out of 190 countries do not have accurate coastal maps. And so we've been able to develop a, uh, I call it a homebrew technique 
using drones to actually do this mapping. This is something that's normally done at huge expense by countries like the United States using uh, low flying aircraft. So that's another kind of work that we've done to support the town. And this is here a rendering of the 3D model that we've created. So this is not a photograph. This is actually a constructed 3D model by LIDAR pinging from drones. Um, we've also done work on mapping the visitor sites. Uh, this is Ro Rosa Blanca, a new visitor site in Galapagos. So these are now into the national park, something we collaborate with the park on for those of you who have any interest in GIS. Finally, the last project I'll tell you about is actually a project that was 100% conceived of by undergraduates and uh, piloted by undergraduates and now uh, is starting to have a life of its own um, based on former undergraduates. And that's that I mentioned at the beginning, most of the people that live in Galapagos have never actually seen Galapagos as we gringos think of Galapagos, the actual national park. And the reason for that is because there are really, really strict protections on the national park. The protections are, you may not enter the national park without a naturalist guide who's licensed by the park on a formal tour. And as a result, that means that it costs probably a minimum of $100 to go on a day trip into the park, often more like $150 or $200. So to a kind of regular Ecuadorian population who lives in the islands, that's just not accessible. So you couldn't like have a nice family weekend of taking your whole family somewhere in the national park. And as a result, I think something like 80% of the people who live there have never been anywhere into the national park, which is just obscene if we're asking the people that live in Galapagos to live this life of restriction in order to protect the park. So the really brilliant idea that Penn undergraduates came up with was, let's just charter boats, hire a guide, and design a trip specifically for the residents that really interprets things in terms that are meaningful and significant to them. And here you're seeing some of the first pilots where we took all women and children and we took them into the national park and really showed them something that they had never seen before. Um, here you see uh, uh, my son in the foreground a couple of years ago and some of Galapagos children uh, next to him. And I think this is really the, the this, this to me uh, epitomizes why we're doing what we're doing because we, um, at least people like me, 43 years old, have had a chance to see Galapagos as this absolutely magnificent place, uh, the place that inspired Darwin, the place that has 95% of its native biodiversity. But these guys are not going to have a chance to see that as adults unless we can do something between now and the time that they grew up. And one thing we can do, of course, is continue to maintain all the international pressure to have strong protections in the park. But none of that's going to mean anything if we can't actually engage the local community that's living right at the edge of the park. So the work that Penn has tried to do in Galapagos is to think about conservation as something that involves people first and foremost. So I call the approach that we take social ecology, the idea being that it has to be bottom up and in partnership with local communities. Um, the, like I say, the, the, the Penn kind of flagship projects are in Galapagos, but we're starting to work elsewhere too. And the ultimate goal is really to create, to take this model of community engagement and make this, um, this our unique pen project to take it around the world, to think of a new way of uh, doing conservation work and to do it that it's where it's not just about biology, even though that's centrally important, but it's about political science and education and psychology and design and health and everything else. So there are lots of um, pieces of this work that will continue into the future. Um, but rather than show you all of those, I would love to have a conversation. I will just tell you that kind of on the, what, if you wonder what's upcoming, in addition to continuing these projects, we have a new project about agroecology. So this is, help, this is basically helping um, build up the agricultural capacity of Galapagos with, but do it in a way that's actually um, ecologically sound. We have a project um, that's about, we, we work with a vet school on a project, they call it One Health. So this is like public health for humans and public health for non-humans coming together. So we're studying coliform contamination on the beaches. And then we have a lot of other educational project uh, projects in the future. I do wanna just show you one more slide because I can't resist. So it's like my ultimate vision of the future is this. So if you're familiar with, with uh, the details of American history during um, the Depression, we had the Civilian Conservation Corps. So I think what Galapagos needs ultimately 
is a Galapagos Conservation Corps. And I think what we're trying to do is build that and build this model of communi community-based participatory action for environmental protection. Um, one of the other projects of Perry World House is to do this, but in the climate, more generally in the climate change arena. And so that's something that we can also discuss. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I would love to hear all of your questions. And if not, I can just keep talking because I'm a professor and we just, we can do that for hours. All right, so let's have your, let's, let's, what are your questions? You can either um, just jump in or you can leave it in the chat box and we will uh, grab it from there. Do we have any Ecuadorians by the way? We do. Mucho gusto. De donde eres? I am from Quito. Quito, okay. I'm calling from them right now. All right. Poor, do you know that we had last year, Otto was our uh, a visitor to Perry World House right before COVID. And yes, so, I've been told yeah, that he went there. Yes. Diana, are you also Ecuadorian? Yeah, I'm from Guayaquil. Okay. We're gonna have to have a we're gonna have to have a fight right here live on the uh, on the uh, Zoom about this you know the Serranos and anyway. What are your questions seriously? Um, I, I'm just curious as could you to, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, hi, I'm Logan. Uh, I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I live in Philly. Um, so. You mentioned uh, when you were talking about how the people came to the Galapagos Islands, you said that they were um, like they're not native to the islands and they came from the mainland. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that like a government initiative or some sort or, or it, did they move naturally? I, I, I was just curious about. Yeah, that. no, it's a really interesting question and it's kind of a complicated question. So, um, yes, the so the there was there was nobody there. Um, and partly just because there's no water, there's, there's, but there's no evidence that the Polynesians found it. Um, it was known already in the 16th century by whalers as a place that you could kind of like, uh, well, since you're from Philly, I'll say like the Wawa in the East Pacific that you could kind of stop and pick up a giant tortoise to, uh, for food. Um, and then when Darwin went there, there was a small garrison living there because uh, Ecuador had tried, uh, you're gonna to have to help me, Leah and Diana, but I think it's 18, in the 1830s was the Republic of Ecuador, right? 1835. Okay, 1835, right. I knew it was right around that time. Um, and of course it was Guayaquil that was first, not Quito, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, that, we'll get that in another moment. But, but Ecuador knew that they needed to hold on to Galapagos because it's, it's a long way away, right? I mean, it's, and so they tried putting prison colonies there, familiar, familiar strategy from the UK, right? Um, but that didn't really, uh, didn't really work very well because there was just not a lot of resources. Um, the kind of earliest settlers were some Norwegians who wanted to guess what, smoke fish, kind of a, a cultural stereotype that turns out to be true in this case, and some Germans who um, were basically looking for the most remote place that they could go to get away from it all. And um, there were some early Ecuadorian settlement um, between the two wars, uh, and but it was very spontaneous initially, just kind of you know a couple of fishermen that that went out there. Eventually, um, when the park was declared in 1959 and the um, Darwin Foundation was set up, there were still very few people living there. But at that point, there needed to be some people to kind of support the park, and the and and slowly but surely, people started to come. Then eventually when tourism began in Galapagos, there was actually uh, the need to actually have people to support tourism that was there. And there was some program on the, from the side of the Ecuadorian government to help people live there. And there still is, there's actually a, um, there's a, the, the minimum wage is higher in Galapagos because everything's more expensive. But in 1989, I believe it was, um, a special law was created for Galapagos um, and it creates essentially a country within a country. It has, it has its own, ex, own laws. And one of the things that those laws did was restricted all new immigration. And that was, um, like I said, it was 1989, it was a long time ago. And there were only still a few, there were certainly under 10,000 people. I think there were like five or 6,000 people at this point. 
And so there's been really no new immigration. You have to either marry in or have a very special reason for being there now. But the you know there's South American birth rates, and so the population has increased quite a lot since then. Um, but there's been there was a kind of period where there was uh, there was an interest in moving people to Galapagos, and then a period where the, they don't want anybody to live there. And right now it's a disaster because essentially the entire economy is based on tourism. And there is no tourism right now. I mean, there were some people, they let some people in this month and then that, that's ended again because they had some more cases of COVID, but they couldn't let COVID go crazy in Galapagos because there's really only one hospital and like two ventilators. So it would not, would not have gone well. Logan, it's a complicated question and I teach a whole course on it, which all of you should sign up for from Penn Global next year. Um, you can't all take it, but the course has a trip. So it might be extra interesting. But it's a great long story. Okay, other questions. I have a how question. Does, I see. Mm -hmm. how, how, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. My name is Ashley. I'm a current incoming freshman to Wharton. My question is that, like, since you mentioned that, like, the Galapagos is pretty closed off and that the tourists usually take advantage of, like, the nature of the island, how do you reconcile that as, like, visitors coming into the Galapagos? Um, and are you like, does that make you more mindful of the space? Like, how do you adapt to the environment to where you're not like another nu nuisance to the native yeah. people? So it's a really interesting question, Ashley. Thank you for that. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of layers of that question. So one, you didn't ask, but it's kind of implicit is like, aren't the tourists really the threat? Not the, you know, what aren't they the biggest threat? Um, certainly, if you read articles in the New York Times, that's how they make it seem like, you know, Galapagos threatened by more tourists. It remains to be seen now what the tourism level will be. But in the last couple of years, it's been huge numbers of tourists. Like, I mean, huge for Galapagos is like 250,000, which is small for most of the rest of the world. But it is not an easy place to get to. Um, but, it, you know, it used to be you'd see 50,000 tourists, 70,000 tourists. Now you're seeing 250,000. Um, so tourism in Galapagos is not one thing. So there's basically two models of tourism. One is you land, so you can actually fly there. You land in the, the small airport, you get onto a boat, you stay on the boat, and then you leave. That kind of tourism is pretty minimal in its impact on the environment because you're not stressing the, um, you know, you're just landing on the islands to visit a site and then you go back onto the boat. And you're kind of bringing your, they bring your, their own food and the boats, you know, distill fresh water from seawater. Of course, there's like diesel fuel that's used, but you got to imagine that these tourists would be, if they weren't going to Galapagos, they'd go somewhere else. So that's probably not a particularly impactful way of tourism. The, the bad part of the impact, though, is that that kind of tourism doesn't help the local economy at all. So most of those tour companies, even if they're like nominally Ecuadorian, most of the money flows outside of the country, let alone the Galapagos. So that's about, nowadays that was about 50% of tourists. The other 50% of tourists stay in the towns. There are basically three and a half towns. Um, actually, it's more like 3.1 towns. The one town has 170 people on it. Um, and if you do that, of course, you help the local economy because there are no big hotels or anything. Everything's owned, everything's small and owned by local people. But then you're actually stressing the, the water supply, the sewage, uh, infrastructure and everything else. So it's there's definitely a lot of impact of Galapagos tourists. That said, there are responsible ways to go and non-responsible ways to go. And you know, and that when Penn takes students or Penn takes alumni, we try to go in really responsible ways. And I, the reason that I think that the people living there are potentially a bigger threat, but also potentially the best allies of the place is because they're there every day. And so every decision that someone makes in Galapagos, like what kind of detergent to use and how much water to use, and how much electricity to use, every one of those decisions really directly impacts the park. And so, you know, most people have worked exclusively in the wild areas or with tourists. And the reason that we've worked with the local community is because we think it's, you know, kind of has the most direct impact. I hope that got to your question, Ashley. Yeah, thank you. That's really insightful. Um, a couple of you asked about uh, getting involved um, in these projects. Um, the best thing you can do is just send me an email um, I'll just type it into the uh, chat, or maybe um, maybe uh, Alice or Lauren can do that, my email address. Um, I will be happy to kind of like tell you more. 
Um, this is, <coughs> you know, we have a big campus-wide research project, um, but a really good way to do it is I, I do teach this class, which I mentioned, I'll teach it next fall. Um, it's, it's part of the global seminar series. So Penn has this really great series of courses that are focused on other countries from all different disciplines and that involve a travel component. So mine's called Evolution's Laboratory. It's about Galapagos. So that's another way. But if you're quite interested, but if you're interested in, in getting involved this year, would love to have your help. I mean, there's always a million things to do, especially now that we're doing everything by WhatsApp. Uh, it takes even more people to, to make anything happen. And so be glad to have your help. I'm looking at you Ecuadorians on the call. So <laughs> we, okay, let me see. Uh, other Melissa asks, do you want to ask it? Uh, uh, do you want to turn your uh, microphone on, Melissa, and ask a question? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Melissa Nong. I'm at the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania. Uh, my question was, do you see these kind of pen environmental projects expanding to like other places or islands where we could start our own kind of initiatives? Do you have something specific in mind? Or I mean, I because the answer is yes, but I'm curious. What you're <laughs> no, I was just because I imagine that there's other islands other than the Galapagos where local community local communities kind of struggle with their environment. So oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, of course, I always think of the hardest possible places to work. Like, you know, I was thinking, would be cool to do it in Ushuaia, which is if you don't know where Ushuaia is, like the very southern tip of Patagonia, like as close to Antarctica as you can get without crossing the Drake Passage. Uh, Cause that's, I'm kind of crazy like that, but um, I absolutely, so my kind of long-term vision of all this work is that this is our model and that we try to take this around the world to other sites. So I, I have people I work with kind of in the Canadian Arctic, in Israel, in Botswana, in Australia, and um, we're talking about this, like how can we create a network around the world? I mean, that's the vision ultimately is this, um, this approach, this social ecology approach I'm talking about where you really work directly with local communities to, for them to participate in the protection of the places that they live. It's not like we're the first people to ever do that. I just think we've done it really effectively here. And I think I would love to take this model on the road. So that's also one of the reasons why it's great to talk to lots of Penn undergraduates because you know, one day we will have someone from Ushuaia or from, you know, a really northern part of Alaska. I also think, frankly, though, we should try to take it probably to southwest Philadelphia first, because we it's much less exotic, but it's also really important. We actually have the United States's first botanical garden, um, not far from Penn, nestled between uh, 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 different parts of a refinery site. It's one of the weirdest thing places you can go. It's this spectacularly beautiful place with big tanks of, you know, uh, of petroleum on either side. So there's there's a lot to be done. And so the more of you that want to get involved, the merrier. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited. Great. Um, not tracking so well the chat, so just feel free to jump in if you wish. Sure. Uh, I was wondering what the you guys are doing now with the program, now that you can't directly be in the Galapagos, like how you guys are doing it. Um, Communicating sure. With the community now. So I'll tell you a couple of things that we're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously we're remote, which really is very, I mean, it's, I had to like go through a period of depression. I mean, as I'm sure many of you guys do with your freshman year being, you know, screwed up. Um, it was so hard for me um, because I like work in Galapagos and I work on like international climate negotiations. So, and I, and I missed a trip to Antarctica. So everything is like ruined by this, but we've, we've managed to do a couple of things. So we, one new project of ours was about, um, I don't have a great name for it. I call it like green business consulting. So we sort of had the idea that a lot of the, um, the local business owners in Galapagos, this is pre-COVID, wanted to grow their businesses a little bit bigger, but to do it in a sustainable way and didn't really have good tools to do that. So we decided the plan had been to this summer in person start working with them directly. And I had recruited a team of undergraduates from the Risk Center at Wharton who were really interested both in business and in environment to, to really be the team. Well, we couldn't do exactly that, but we were able to still do the project. In this case, most of the business owners just wanted to know like how to save their business, like how to, because they didn't have those skills. So we still work with six or seven businesses remotely by WhatsApp and by Zoom actually now works. Normally Galapagos Wi-Fi is like dial-up speed. If, 
you guys maybe know what that's like just because it's so uh, remote, it's all satellite based, but with no tourists around, it's a little bit better. So we could do some Zoom, we could do WhatsApp. So we definitely did that. Um, we've done our, our uh, C, the, the uh, benthic cover, so the monitoring this undersea part, um, because uh, we have naturalists on the ground there that work with us. We have a full-time person in Galapagos who's there now, Ernesto Vaca is his name. And so Ernesto has been working with us. So we've done a lot of those projects. We've tried to do some other things by WhatsApp less successfully. We've done a lot of mapping projects with the park. I've been doing a lot of high level political things. So if you follow the news, there's this um, Chinese fishing fleet that's sitting just outside the Galapagos Marine Reserve. In fact, I have a call at one o'clock um, our time here with the foreign minister for Ecuador to talk about this actually. So we have a project where we're trying to come up with like a good legal and diplomatic strategy. Um, Ecuador has a complicated relationship with China because China owns a lot of Ecuadorian debt. Um, it's a very, if you're interested in geopolitics, it's a very interesting, complicated issue. Why Ecuador can't just hammer that fishing fleet. They're also technically not doing anything illegal. They're sitting just outside the economic exclusion zone. So there's an interesting question of what you can do about a fleet that's in the high seas. So that's so that's something that we've been doing. But you know, I have a million schemes, and so uh, there are always always things to do. Is that, Ezra, I hope that gave you some indication. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. I'll also just say that you know, think for those of us thinking big picture about Galapagos or really any environmental problem coming off of COVID is, um, I mean, it's it's tragic, but it's also an opportunity because we could you know keep we could try to like get back to where things were, which would be a disaster environmentally for the world. Or we could take the opportunity to, as Biden says, build back better, but like to really think about that idea. What would, you know, okay, so now tourism, I, I don't know, you think, you tell me, when do you think the average tourist in Galapagos is probably 68 years old, you know, kind of a wealthy gringo who's 68 years old. When are they gonna get on a, net, a plane again and, and get on three airplanes and then be on a boat for a week? It's gonna be a while, right? Like even if there's a vaccine in, in February, it's gonna be a while till we get back to 250,000 of those people coming a year. So it's an opportunity to actually rethink the whole system. And so I really would love lots of creative, engaged students to help on that project. Um, okay, thanks Ezra from Vancouver. So not quite the Arctic, but- Not quite. You, got, but got it, you do have the Pacific side. Ocean at least. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Those of you who are still here, are you like, um, I mean, is this kind of stuff you're, 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 what you're keen on or climate change or like what, what, what sorts of issues are most exciting to you in the, kind of in this general space? I could tell you more about what we're doing. It's really okay, jump in. Go ahead, Personally, I, I was interested in like the intersection between like public health and conservation. And then when I saw this presentorial, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Yeah, yeah. The no, first thing I've seen that kind of covers that. So you should definitely check out like, I mean, obviously the vet school is not an undergraduate school, but this one health idea that they work from, which is, so I'll tell you about a project they're going to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it, it It's slightly awkward for me because I'm a vegetarian, but they're, um, they want to work with the pig farmers. So there's some pig farmers in Galapagos and to try to, I mean, I definitely believe in increasing animal welfare, but you know, increasing animal welfare to kill them and eat them is, I don't know. But anyway, that's one project that the One Health folks want to do because obviously like agricultural animals are an important part of human health. And the other project, which is uh, really neat, is a, um, a seawater monitoring project. So it turns out that these there are these mini uh, QPCR units. So QPCR is quantitative PCR. PCR is the re reaction that you can use to amplify DNA and RNA. And if you do it in a quantitative way, you can use it almost like um, a diagnostic tool. In fact, that's how the COVID-19 tests work. And so you can take seawater and you can look for fecal coliform contamination. And then you can try to figure out what species it's from. So you can sort of see like, we know that there's a lot of contamination in that bay now that you saw the fl drone fly over. Is it coming from sea lions? Is it coming from dogs? Is it coming from raw human sewage being pumped in the bay? So we have a project that we're going to develop there. And then the idea is that there are these portable units now. So we could take some and like train local people to use them and leave them in place to actually build the local capacity. 
So that's another kind of cool public health biology meeting system. I can go. Um, I was, I'm really interested in like geopolitics and just like seeing how we as an institution that has so many resources can help in like areas such as the Galapagos that aren't really developed. So I think that that's been really interesting, just kind of learning throughout this preceptorial. Mm -hmm. And Ecuador is like the most interesting country in South America. So you'll, 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 uh, you'll, I'm a, you'll learn that and they have the best chocolate and coffee too. So that's all the more reason to, to work there. Right. I know that's why you're working there actually. The chocolate and coffee. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Um, I see that, uh, um, you know, one thing for those of you that are interested in climate change, um, you know, there's lots of projects, large and small, but um, we will have in a couple of weeks, um, our, our big, one of our big colloquia for the year at Perry World House is on climate change, and specifically on the kind of thing you're talking about, Ashley. So it's, uh, it's about refugees, like climate change driven refugee crisis. And so the part, the public parts are these three keynote lectures. So one is the executive secretary of the UN climate change. Um, so Patricia Espinoza, and then one's Chuck Hagel, who used to be the secretary of defense. And the other is the former president of Kiribati, which is one of the islands that's like most threatened by climate change. So if you're interested in geopolitics and, and environmental issues, that'll be a great thing. Um, could you Tell me, Alice, what date that is. Yeah, of course. So the three conversations are happening over three days. So the first one on the 14th is going to be with Anote Tong, the, the former president of Kiribati. And basically because his, his uh, nation is like in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they've had to really face a lot of the issues that we're going to be facing in places like America. And like maybe Except like that their whole country, country is going to be under the water. Yeah, the whole place is going to completely, yeah. So it's like, it's a very interesting, um, like he's basically already experiencing what we haven't experienced yet. And it's a really going to be a really interesting conversation to get his insights. So I'm going to share that link with you now if you want to sign up for that. Mm -hmm. And then our second um one is going to be with uh, the Honorable Chuck Hagel, who served as Secretary of Defense from, I think it was 2013 to 2015. And he's going to be talking about national security and climate change, which is a really interesting kind of intersection of those two issues. And then our third one, is, as Michael already mentioned, is on the 16th, and that's going to be with Patricia Espinosa, who is the um, uh, current, she was a really senior diplomat for Mexico for many years, she used to be their Minister of Foreign Affairs. And um, she's currently uh, serving as the, as the head, basically, of UN climate change, which is what, do you remember, do you know, there's like big conferences like COP25 where Greta Thunberg would go and speak. They basically right. head up, all, they run all of that. Exactly. So and, it's and really that's, interesting. And that's what um, the UNFCCC or UN climate change, that's what, like, Perry Woodhouse is very, very deep, tight connection with that group. In fact, we, we're having our first uh, inter joint intern this year between Perry Woodhouse and the UNFCCC. So that's, for those of you interested in climate change, that's kind of a cool uh, connection that Penn has uh, in this kind of space of geopolitics and climate. Um, also, the following week after these, this colloquium is Penn Climate Week, and there's like 25 other really amazing events. We have the leadoff event that week. On the Monday of Climate Week, we'll have a talk with um, Sue Benias, who's one of our fellows this year, and she was one of the lead climate negotiators for the United States for the Paris Agreement. So she, I mean, we will... I don't know how she, she she probably won't want to like say some of these things so boldly, but she's literally responsible for huge amounts of the like nuts and bolts details of the Paris Agreement, down to the fact that it uh, doesn't have names on the articles, just article numbers. That was a diplomatic trick to get more people. To, not trick, technique to get more people to sign up for it. Names are very powerful. Um, we I can also just mention since some you know. Some of you I know are interested in climate. Perry World House, um, we sent a big delegation to uh, the last of uh, these, uh, Alice mentioned it's COP meetings, COP25, COP is uh, Conference of the Parties. So I think you saw like on the news, Greta was at this one and we were there. Um, so Jocelyn Perry, one of our program managers and I spoke at a lot of it. Mauricio Rodas, one of our fellows and also Coco Warner, who's a current fellow is a senior diplomat in the UN climate change. But anyway. You can get in touch with me if you're curious about those things too. All right, we have a couple of minutes left if anyone has any last minute questions. There's lots of people on the call who we haven't heard from, that's just fine. You can always type your question in the chat. I know it's Friday, getting late. Ready for some cheap plays. 
Leah, you'll appreciate that I make uh, I make very good uh, ceviche de chochos because I'm a vegetarian. So it's nice. I love that. I'm a vegetarian too. So I the, what, the trade re- what trade recipes then? I also Definitely make with the palmito sure. with palmitos. So that's a good one for sure. For sure. Okay, so let me then, um, like I said, please feel free to get in touch with questions, but let me just um, mention a couple of uh, last minute things then. So um, Alice is gonna put a link in the chat for just generally for the Perry World House mailing list. There are tons of activities that are of interest. Obviously you've all stayed on the call this long, you're interested in the international space. Um, and you know, this is the kind of intersection of science and international. We have lots of great things like that. Um, the NSO, the, which you're all participating in has also asked us to give you a survey. So if you'll fill that out, we would be grateful. Um, I will make you ceviche when we can all be together again, if you if you were to do these things for us. Um, also, um, the, this preceptorial is being recorded. So it will be posted to the uh, NSO website. And um, if you go back and have any questions, you found that I made any mistakes, whatever, please be in touch. You can either, um, you know, write to Perry Roadhouse or you can write directly to me. You have my email address in the chat. And finally, um, we definitely have like, thanks to Alice on the call here, who's listed as Perry Roadhouse in her box. We have a great uh, social media game, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, probably things that we should know about that we don't yet. We, we need a Perry Roadhouse TikTok. What do you think, Alice? Oh, I don't. Mm. We had a whole thing about TikTok earlier in the I week. Know, so yes. anyone who was on this call is we want to see. We want to well, uh, would like to see. TikTok. Yeah, we want to see dancing everybody on TikTok for for about world affairs or something, right? Um, but yeah, it would be really great to stay in touch with all of you. I really hope we can all be together physically really soon because um, I don't know about you, but I don't like this world that we're living in right now. So wear your wear your masks and let's get through this, and and we'll all be together. You'll see our beautiful building, and uh, hopefully we can be in it soon. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we can, uh, some of you will work with us in Galapagos. It'll be really great. We'd love to, love to have new uh, students involved. So thank you all very much. Have a really great Friday and great weekend and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye everybody.